Hello, we're here with Andrea Robinson, who is running for Superior, King County Superior Court Judge position 13. Would you like to go ahead with your uh, two minute introduction? Sure. Um, I'm here to run for position 13, as you said, to replace Teresa Doyle, who's retiring at the end of her term. I am a trial lawyer with almost 22 years of experience. And the reason that I'm here is I was encouraged and recruited by a number of Superior Court judges who are deeply concerned about the recent loss of experienced trial judges on the bench. Now, my campaign is just starting. I filed on Wednesday night, but already I've accumulated 25 judicial endorsements and more are coming in every day. And these are judges who are familiar with my work and they also think this position needs to be filled by an attorney who has a skill set like mine. I am a graduate of the University of Washington Law School and I continue to teach their advanced trial advocacy. I began my career as a public defender and then I transitioned into private practice where I've continued to defend uh, in criminal matters. I appear in court almost daily. And since 2010, my husband and I have operated a firm together. He is also an attorney. The two of us have two children. We live in North Seattle. Now I bring to the bench over two decades of experience. I am a passionate defender of the accused, so I'm deeply familiar with the challenges that are faced by anyone who finds themselves in the criminal justice system. And it's important to me to become involved, particularly at this juncture, because in the post-COVID landscape, there are going to be a lot of unique challenges and obstacles for the court to overcome. Already there is a massive backlog of seconds and criminal cases. And those judges who are going to deal with those challenges, they have to come with a level of knowledge and experience to hit the ground running and solve the issues that'll preserve both the health and the safety of jurors and litigants, but also preserve due process and access to justice. So I'm very much uh, appreciative of you hearing me today and I'm asking for your endorsement. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're gonna move into uh, the four prepared questions that we have for you um, that we're asking all uh, Superior Court judges or judge candidates. And the responses to these are two minutes apiece. Uh, and I have uh, the four questions being asked by uh, Katie, Jason, Jeff, and Jason. And Mackenzie has posted uh, them into the chat box in case you wanna read along. Okay. Um, question one, uh, what are the pros and cons of going to the bench as compared to practicing law? Oh, okay. So uh, the pros are, in, in my mind, an ability to elevate my level of involvement in providing access to justice. It's something I've wanted to do for a few years. I've been becoming involved kind of late in this process, but it isn't something that I haven't been ready for. Um, so definitely the, the major pro for me is to be able to have a greater level of involvement in preserving that justice. The cons, I think, would be working directly with a person as an advocate. I've become quite attached to some of my clients over the years because you get inside their life story and you're having to present that to both a prosecutor, a jury, or to a judge. And so to lose that personal connection to a client, I think is going to be something that'll be a little bit hard, but what's important is I think I'll be able to uh, infuse my job as a judge with the empathy that I've gained in dealing with folks who are usually marginalized when they're dealing with criminal justice uh, system. Thank you. Uh, Jason, question two. Sure. Um, what have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiencies? And a uh, second question is, what other methods would you suggest? Okay, great. Um, this is a hot topic, and it's something that I've been hearing from many judges and uh, practicing attorneys. We're at a cornerstone of where a lot of things need to be re-examined. And not only is it necessary because of COVID, but it's something that needed attention for a long time. There are a lot of inefficiencies in having court appearances required for folks when there really isn't procedurally much happening. I can't tell you how many hearings my clients have had to take time off of work sometimes to great economic detriment to just come from minor procedural hearings. So one of the biggest things that I think has uh, come about most recently is the courts opening themselves up to video appearances like this one um, and ways in which to try to streamline the process in order to allow due process to be preserved, but at the same time, keep from disproportionately impacting folks who, particularly from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, who are harmed to a great degree just in order to receive the due process that they need. 
Great, thank you. Uh, question three, uh, Jeff. As a judge, what would you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Okay, so greatest strengths I think would be uh, my over two decades of experience. I think that knowing how court process trials work, dealing with jurors, dealing with judges and clients has given me a great deal of background to pull from. Um, my empathy, I think it's also an incredible strength. It's something that I'm going to have to use carefully because I need to maintain a neutral position, but I think it's really important for a judge to come from a standpoint of knowing more about the human side of the trial practice and process. Um, as far as weaknesses, I think a little bit of that would have to be held in check. Uh, I obviously come into this as a passionate defender of the accused, and so it's going to take a little bit of adjustment to be able to get used to seeing things on a broader level. It's something I've had in the back of my mind in the last several years in terms of how this needs to be seen from a judicial standpoint. Um, so that will take a little bit of adjustment, but uh, I think that it's far outweighed by my experience in general and this, the uh, lens that I view things through as I take the bench. Uh, question number four, McKenzie. Yes, uh, can you describe your most difficult case? Uh, why was it difficult and how did you handle it? I think the most difficult cases I've become involved in, there's two different categories and I can get specific about each, but um, the category that is difficult on an emotional level is dealing with folks who start off uh, way behind the race. And this is because of a number of biases and prejudices and either it's a client of color who, uh, for example, a few months ago, I, I represented a gentleman who was pulled over and immediately was brought out of his vehicle at gunpoint for no other reason than the fact that he was in a county uh, where there was a very low population of persons of color um, and he's pulled over for a minor traffic infraction and suddenly it became a very elevated situation merely because of the color of his skin. Um, so those are difficult from an emotional standpoint because there's a sense of shock and outrage right from the get-go. Uh, I do have a case that brought tremendous um, Kind of emotional impact to me and that was because there was a, an incredible story and exp explanation why my client was facing several major felonies after a lifetime of having no other criminal matters and one of the reasons it was very difficult is i wanted to tell this client's story but ultimately because of the sentencing reform act and the restrictions placed on judges abilities to give certain sentences it didn't make sense in the end for the client to take on the risks of facing the SRA. And so unfortunately, as much as that story needed to be told, I had to make a judgment call and, and talk to the client about dealing with the negotiated outcome of the case. So those are very difficult. 30 in, seconds. In which uh, my hands are tied as an advocate or a judge's hands are tied in the sentencing realm. And so that's become uh, probably some of my more difficult cases, but those are just two examples. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're moving into our follow-up questions and the responses to these are one minute, one minute piece. And um, so I'll go ahead and open that up to everyone. Uh, if either raise your hand or post a comment in the chat box. Follow-up questions. I have a bunch of them. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll go first. So, um, do you believe that the composition of juries um, adequately represents or fairly represents or reflects society at large? No, not at all. Um, the uh, judge who first contacted me on Tuesday night and encouraged me to run is Steve Rosen, who I've known for over 20 years. Um, and he's working on a task force to address racial disparity in jury pools. There are a number of reasons I think that lead to that, not the least of which is it's extremely difficult to ask anyone, uh, regardless of where they come from, to show up for 10 or $15 a day to be a juror when uh, they have major impacts on them from a, a financial standpoint. So that's only seconds. one of many different facets why I do not believe they are representative of society at large. It definitely needs attention. And I'm excited to be closely connected to one of the Superior Court judges who's on that task force. That's definitely a, a project that I would want to be involved in. Great, thank you. Um, Jason. Uh, yes, um, could you give us a, a statement of your judicial uh, philosophy? My judicial philosophy? Um, 
Well, it's difficult because to the extent that I'm going to give you anything that would uh, constitute something that sounds like a promise uh, <laughs> in terms of matters that might be before, me, be before me in the future, that's prohibited by the Code of Judicial Conduct. Um, I will say that I am not so much a textualist because I believe that the statutes and uh, precedent need to be viewed with the lens of what is actually happening before me. So for, to the extent that I am a strict constructionalist of, of statutes and, and cases, I definitely wouldn't put myself in that category. I think it's important for judges to stay abreast of changes in technology. I can think of one instance, a judge who I think would be a good model for something that I would be towards, um, was willing to throw out a serious violent felony case because of a lack of preservation of exculpatory evidence. And Ten one seconds. of those, uh, aspects was the fact that standing case law required bad faith and she was willing to look at the changes in technology and agree with me that it should be read in a more expansive form. Sorry, that's a difficult question to answer. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, just kind of a general question here. So you do have a, an opponent in this race who we have also interviewed. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just give me a little bit of an idea of uh, why you stand out versus that um, opponent for this endorsement? Well, first off, I, I've never met her personally. Um, all that I've seen and read and heard, she's doing some really important social work. Um, it, really, it's experience. Um, and if she were running for this position after some time spent practicing in the trial process, which is primarily what Superior Court judges do, um, I, perhaps she would be an ideal candidate for this. But she simply does not have the experience that I do. I don't want to say anything about her personally because I have no reason to question her character or work ethic. Um, it simply just comes down to years in court. From my understanding, um, she did a second fellowship in a pros the prosecutor's office, but that's three months compared to 22 years. So um, it's primarily experience. I, I'm really not going to say anything bad about her as um, from a character standpoint or practitioner standpoint. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, any other follow-up questions? Uh, Laura. If appointed to the bench, are there any particular rotations at the Superior Court that you would be interested in? Well, I, I'm very interested in anything that would come my way. I don't have a whole lot of control over what happens. Um, so I, obviously any rotations that would put me on trial calendars would be the most appropriate uh, for someone like me who's been in trial pro uh, practice for, again, over 20 years. Um, so interest level versus what control I have over it are two different things. Um, I'm also interested in, in seeing the juvenile court system. Most cases from the defense standpoint are represented by appointed counsel. So I haven't had seconds. cases in the juvenile area, um, but I've certainly had cases there. And the, the issues are a lot more complex uh, and the involvement of parents in dealing with solving the problems are the type of solutions that need to come uh, for kids much more so, and definitely part of an expansion of therapeutic alternatives to prosecution, in, even in the adult context. So I'm very interested in a stint in the juvenile court. Great, thank you. Um, further questions? I have another one. Um, let's see. Do you think that the courts have an obligation to improve public um, understanding of the courts? And if so, how should they carry that out? Ah, excellent question. Well, one of the main things that I think judges need to do, particularly when folks show up for uh, their jury service, is to emphasize implicit bias that comes with each person who comes into the system. They serve an incredibly important role. And just like all of us, they come into it with certain privileges or backgrounds or experiences experiences or socioeconomic standpoint, and that might change how they perceive uh, perhaps the reliability or credibility of anyone who's before them, and to encourage them to start right from the beginning of the process and question how their lens is impacting their seconds. view of the evidence before them, I think is a critical job of the judges, and it's something that I intend to do right from day one. Other questions? I have to like look all over the place. <laughs> I have another one. Um, this one's about uh, like alternative dispute resolution. Like what are the pros and cons of that in your opinion? I, I am very much looking forward to the expansion of alternatives to typical uh, prosecution. 
Uh, in my experience in the drug court, I've seen some of the most profound changes in my clients who are given not just a trip through the court system, but an opportunity to profoundly impact their lives and receive uh, resources, referrals, it changes in housing, medical care, and obviously addiction and mental health therapies. So I very much want to see an expansion of that because I think those are the cases and the processes that actually result in long lasting change, a reduction in recidivism, and just an overall improvement in the quality of society. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you. Jason. Uh, yes. Um, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, where do you see our judicial system, um, especially on the criminal side, heading? Just in general? In general. Well, I hope to see more women on the bench, frankly. <laughs> um, and I hope to see a greater expansion of ways in which to deal with the criminal justice system that aren't simply about just prosecution and locking folks up. I think there needs to be uh, a more profound look at things. I can tell you that anyone who walks in the door in my office comes to me at usually a time of a profound crisis and whether that means that they are suffering from addiction or kind of a breakdown in how seconds. life is held together due to mental health challenges or because of institutionalized racism uh, when you look at why they are there uh, you know that the problem needs to be not just how do we deal with this allegation but how do you deal with these challenges that you're you're addressing on a daily basis so what I'd like to see is the system Ten become seconds. more adaptive to addressing things on that level. Obviously, due process in the courts and upholding constitutional uh, rights is of primary importance, but there needs to be a more nuanced criminal justice system. Boy, these are hard to answer. They're such complex questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay. <laughs> Um, so, as as you were talking about diversion programs, et cetera, I, um, I, I work with one called LEAD, and I'm wondering how familiar you are with that, uh, with that process and how you feel that you might interact with that as, as a judge. So it's law enforcement assisted diversion. I, I'm familiar with some of the prosecutors that I have worked with in the past, past who have gone on to work with the LEAD program. I think very highly of those prosecutors, and I've talked to them briefly about their experience, and it seems really important for that type of thing to be there. Um, I can't say that I've had any firsthand experience because I'm normally dealing with folks once they're charged and brought into the system. Um, but I think that the program itself is wonderful. In theory, it needs to probably have a little more attention and budgeting. Um, but yes, I'm very supportive of the general premise of it. But I can't say that I have a whole lot of familiarity with the, the nuances of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I have my my old standby. Uh, what are your uh, major influences in your life? Major influences? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, it's real easy to say someone like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and of course, that stuff like that is is easy enough to say and definitely profoundly impactful. Um, I, I would say that where I draw a lot of strength and um, confidence and optimism is strong female colleagues, I, I would have to say, is my biggest influence. To be able to work with ladies who are addressing some of the same challenging aspects of this practice has been one of my greatest sources of strength. And Thank I have mentored a number of high school and law school students. Um, and I, they stay in touch with me over the years. And even though I, it's coming from a place of I'm technically a mentor, they influence me as much as I feel like I have influenced them. So I, I think that those are kind of some of the most profound impacts on me as far as folks that I draw strength and encouragement and inspiration from. Great, thank you. All right, and we're at minute 19. So if you would like, you may go ahead and give a one minute wrap up. Thank you so much. I, I just want to emphasize how, how grateful I am for you to take this on. Um, I am coming into this a little late in the process because of the late announcement of the availability of this spot. Um, but I think now is a critical time to have judges on the bench who have knowledge and experience and who can hit the ground running and solve these problems. And so while I am not politically connected, I can tell you that I'm definitely experienced, I'm passionate, and I'm extremely hardworking. And so I would be very appreciative of your endorsement for this position. Great, thank you so much.